pro, um, Congress, but what I'd like to say is that I'm going to bring together ethics and professional excellence, and this is very relevant to us, especially because what we have in our hands is a big challenge, a big challenge that's anti-fools. If it's well interpreted, it's going to help you and it's going to help a lot of physicians. The patient is the instrument to perform a good diagnosis. The patient is going to help the cardiologist, so the care process needs to be followed well. Someone was telling us, okay, what happened with what patients want? And this is from the survey that were interviewed, and they were asked, what do you want from your physicians? Like, what we were saying today, what do you want from your tests? And they said, mainly we want them to smile, even if they know we're sick. We want them to smile at us because it's going to encourage us. We want them to recognize us, to acknowledge us, to say our names, to acknowledge that we are the sick ones, but that we are not the disease. We want them to be optimistic because dying is a big end. And it's beautiful to be able to do this. We want them to be disciplined. Sometimes we see the circus. There's a different way to do things. Uh, variability is something that should be controlled. We want them to be prudent. We want them to be prudent in their uh, reports. We want them to be brave when they face increasingly challenging aspects in terms of leadership, administration, communication, but above all, we should transmit this to our teams. The most important thing about physicians and the teams that we're leading as physicians is that we provide answers to patients' questions, to their needs. We want, must respond to their needs rather than <coughs> to our needs related to productivity or production. It's important here to know what the patient wants, but what do they want? What does the body of doctors want? What does the American Society of Doctors want? We want them to feel things. We want them, we want seven things from them. And especially imaging professionals, evaluating the appropriateness of the imaging exam. That's why I'm glad to talk about this the real participation of informed consent. This has a big legal repercussion, but also from the legal point of, from the ethical point of view, it's very important for the patient to be part of the processes. Protection of the patient's best interest, and this can be materialized when we're saying whether the patient needs this test or not, or how we're going to provide the results and this can be individualized according to the situation, the best interpretation of images. There's only one probability, the best one. Knowing the specificity, the predictive values, the sensitivity, all the things that we've seen in these two days, we need to do it well. Effective communication with physicians and patients, this is very important in communication. Dr. Mood was saying that for all of us who work in security schemes for the patient, there's a goal that we should know when there's a critical value. And a critical value is not like you're shopping, like going shopping. It's not like when you have two measurements of creating in, so the, bac the bacteria is being reported. We have identified the critical values, and I'm going to talk about this later, but in this case, this was a critical value, and the ethical obligation is to localize the treating physician and tell them. Or we have to catch the patient. When I say catch, is that we need to mitigate risk, and we need to do what we need to do clearly. That's why we need to be present supervising the tests. We need to seek continuous learning. This is what we're doing here. And here there's a question, an interesting question, are we learning, but are we comparing results, and learning is done on results, boards, sharing results, and sh having peer reviews, and 
there we have an interesting thing. How do we compare what we're doing? How do we measure against ourselves whether we're doing things well or not? And continuous improvement of quality. Because the following could happen. Hey, colleagues, look at the image. I think the patient has something. <laughs> what should we do? Let's intervene. Let's have sur surgery. But there's nothing there. This could happen. Decisions go through us, especially when we have well-aligned tests. They know what they have to do when we are giving them reports. And this is only done if we can materialize medical professionalism, which is nothing more than the power to define clearly some fundamental elements of practice, <coughs> among them mastership. The first component of professionalism is only achieved with good education and this should have clear parameters because we are always working under uncertainty. We work adequately every day, we need to be with the patients equally all the time and the machines should always be ready. We know that from the acquisition of imagery we have a lot of validation. How do we depend on the moment of injection? How do we depend upon the reconstruction of the acquisition parameters and for the patient not to move and this is something that we should recognize and what doctor was saying was fantastic because it's reminding us of all those points that are parts of mastery. We need to keep in mind that there's an ever constant change and knowledge is not only generated by medicine but we have so much information from other disciplines that the samples multiply this knowledge so continuous education for uh, processes are very complex and in our case when we depend upon the technology it's even harder yet. It's important for us to know that mastery is not just learning the guidelines. The guidelines are right there. We've talked about the concern about the diagnostic processes with um, artificial intelligence. Now it, nowadays, teenagers have a great word for the, the panicked. Our colleagues are panicked about all these inter, um, artificial intelligence systems that can interpret, but we could separate uh, concepts. For example, we have a, soft, a piece of software that can make some approximations to reading and we show them to the residents, they say, it's, this is going to change our world. We're going to be left without a job in the latest Congress of Radiology. We were talking about AI for 10 sessions. Everyone was concerned. And that's not where it is. Who provides the algorithms? Who knows how to prepare the patient? Who knows how to read the results? Who communicates? This is mastery. And we need to keep in mind that the way we absorb information from other disciplines, we always have a badly structured knowledge. And from the point of view of clinicians, the point of view that we have to have is to care for the patient, understanding what the machines are giving us and translating, us, translating that to understand what should be done. That's mastery. The second component of professionalism is autonomy. And we all say that autonomy is doing what we want, the way we want, but no. 
autonomy in medicine is increasingly limited and the more clinical evidence there is, our autonomy is more restricted. Where we have big gaps of information, we can move freely. But when we have good clinical results, we are moving well. I say that autonomy is where, like playing bowling, and there's a little kid. And you throw the ball, and have you seen that there are some little fences? It, n n no matter how you send it, you always get to the end. <coughs> so medical autonomy means that we are following this path that leads us to the best possible ending, which means that at some point we will be able to remove the restrictions and just give it our all for our patients. We always thought that altruism was everything in medical practice, but it's just one component. It's empathy. It's thinking, what can I do for everyone else? What can I do for them, no matter what I have? And that is the basis for the success of our teams. I've seen many of our technologists who, despite our campaigns um, for security, they sit down with the patient, they hold their hand. We have seen others who are just looking through the window and they just tell them, don't move. This is what we should do. We should promote practice so that the vital experience of each patient is the best, no matter what's happening. And the other powerful component is self-regulation. And we're doing self-regulation here when you're training yourself and you're preparing yourself when you adhere to the guidelines, when you are able to have a guideline, when you can change a practice, when you place your results at the disposal of everyone else, that's self-regulation because that's where the conduct is at risk because it plays in parallel. If I'm able to stop myself, I know that I'm capable of do doing anything for the other. And it's something that's just blah, 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 ethicists always say this, but we can build excellence, and excellence can be built based on some things that are called best practices, or high standards, or doing what you have to do, the way you have to do it, when you have to do it. Easy. Let's look at some examples, practical examples. I'm sure that and across all services, we're doing all this. Let's look at these premises, which are true. We create more images than interpreted, and maybe more than needed for the amount of patients and load of disease. The great benefits of having high technology have a lot of costs, and <laughs> some of the costs is that Imaging professionals are exposed to radiation. It's a high standard to record the absorbed dose of radiation. This makes us think, is it, is it just enough to put it in the report? No, it's a high standard for the next version for a patient to have a record of how many millisieverts they received. It doesn't matter if they got three, four tests done. We work out of need, but they should have a record because they could have come for some disease, but they went out with radiotherapy, whether they wanted it or not. An important thing, due to this amount of tests there are, how do we do it? With a monitoring program for ionizing radiation. It's something that tortures, tortures us, and it's fundamental. And it's knowing that the problem of radiation over sight has four components. The first component is in charge of the patient. First of all, it's based on the first, on the thir three components of oversight programs. Justification, why are we doing it? Optimization of the dose given, and of course, keeping in mind the dosage limit. 
this is something that you could say, okay, I know this, I practice this, I can stop an unnecessary test, I can buy equipment that diminishes dosages. Sometimes we say, should I decrease time and keep the dose? We're free to do anything we want. But the important thing is that the patient's safety is reliant upon us. The second component is workers. And here, we could guarantee time, an adequate distance, shielding, physical protection, and special working protection, special working conditions, protection. And I'm not just talking about radiological protection. We have the best machines, the best professionals, but we forget air conditioning. We forget the best areas for work. We forget that people need to work sitting down. We forget a lot of things, and this is fundamental. We need to protect the public at large. We're part of ethics. Where regulating entities have had to help them. And there are two simple strategies. Do I confine the subject when they're attacked by radiation? Or do I confine the production of radiation from people who create it? That's why we have some special wings from some, for some patients. Or we have some shielded areas, or both. Because we need to keep in mind that there are patients who pay to get irradiated, and some people who get paid to get irradiated, but some people who are not paying or getting paid for getting irradiated, they shouldn't get irradiated. And now we have go to environment. If we ask, or if there were a teenager here, and we told them how our practice goes, I'm sure that they would say that we need to have all the waste management procedures. They would say that we shouldn't have uncontrolled radioactive waste. If teenagers are worried about about all this, then environmental monitoring, then all these protocols are very important when we should follow them. That is how we materialize excellence. Another example of materializing excellence has two components. But let's look at some premises. More personnel, more staff, does not mean better care. We always believe that m the more people, the better the treatment. More square meters in area does not mean that we have better infrastructure. More investment in technology, in dollars, in brands, does not mean either that there is a better practice performed. And many ways to perform one procedure doesn't mean that we have a super service and innovation. That's where we think we shouldn't just be austere. We should be smart and austere. We should think about how to reduce variability, variability in practice. We should have a standardized practice based on processes. And of course, if we have perfectly established processes, I start to communicate on time and adequately because communicating saves lives. Communicates protect, communication protects, and it helps us mitigate risks. And look at this example. This is an example of what's done. Everything that we've been talking about, it's fantastic, everything we've seen, but everything can be summarized in this chart. We have the prescription when we have the order, we have the scheduling, the planning, we have a request for pharmaceuticals, we receive the pharmaceuticals, we check them with whether the dosage uh, matches the patient for what we're doing, we apply this, whether it's done at the right moment, whether the right person is, being, is doing it, whether it's the right test, whether there's a trace for the imaging test. The checklist only responds to a punctual control of specific moments in process quality. St study processing, what are the guidelines to do it? And of course, a reading, not just standardized, but that demands professional validation 
by certified doctors, so we don't leave anything to chance. And this saves lives and generates excellence. Two more strategies, and once again, two points that are real. Between 2 and 30 percent, look at this wide range. 2 to 30 percent of radiological reports can be mistaken. It's terrible when we look at these reports. In nuclear medicine, fortunately, there is no higher amount of reports because we would devote one day to control of reporting misstatement or errors in technique. That's why these processes are fundamental in nuclear medicine. Diagnostic mistakes can be responsible for up to 45% of adverse events in radiology. Many of the clinical decisions are made based on diagnostic imagery reports and this number is terrifying. It means that we're co-responsible for many of the things that happen in the hospital or happen to the patient. And these are the five mistakes we are responsible for, at least when we are interpreting. Not before that, because at the moment of injection, the quality of the pharmaceutical, the type of test performed, or what could happen, the ICRI technology report shows that uh, the worst technological event, first, no alarms, organ perforations, or patients getting squashed by nuclear medicine equipment. Let's forget that. But look at this. Mistakes. One, perception errors. You don't see everything you should see. Sometimes fi we find the biggest thing and we forget the rest. That's why it's important to answer the question and then have a general standardized, organized reading, reasoning mistakes, which is basically due to a loss of situational, situational alert. There's a part that's called identification, indication, technique and description, and fourth, conclusion or diagnostic opinion. This is what sums up when you get to the diagnostic opinion, reasoning mistakes. I made the whole description, but I didn't get it. Medicine is a different practice. Medicine is a practice that's identical to pathology, and it should be provable. So. It's a relationship based on results. Medicine is related to mediums and results. Means and results. Means are conclusions and results are descriptions. That means that we are measured by two standards. And the opinion can be forgivable because it depends on the learning curve, it depends on the state, it has a lot of attenuance, but perception cannot be attenuated. Alliterative errors, and it means copy-paste. The alliterative mistake is where we induce others to keep on making other mistakes, for example. We see this in sequences in radiology for uh, intensi intensive care. Right side catheterization, then the pneumonia is the same, but then the pneumonia is similar. Nobody is seeing what's happening. Everyone does the same, the same, the same thing all over again. For example, nowadays, regarding iterative er errors and copy paste and electronic uh, medical records, there's a huge chapter where the recommendation, the direct recommendation is just remove copy-paste from electronic uh, medical records. And we should remove uh, autocorrection because we are inducing uh, copy-paste and templates and the patient just leaves with the wrong report. 
mistakes due to lack of knowledge and mistakes due to bad technique, overexposure for example. The only way to solve this is with two strategies that need to be applied simultaneously, peer review and structuring of reports or structured reports. The question here is, and the dilemma is, if so many images are created and many of them are not well read, if the scarcity of imaging professionals is so big in the world, how do we devote time to peer reviews? There are many strategies that arise here. One of them is to use AI. Some of them are passed through the system at the end of the day, and then some physicians are assigned, for example, and some alerts are assigned. The other way would be to, how do we do it here? Every time we open a study and the study has, a, is in the PAX system, then the patient has a test and we need to open this history. We need to check this test and we need to score it. If the score is one, then we concur. Two, we have a change in style. Nothing wrong. Three, there was a finding, an interesting finding, additional to the other one, which just merits an addendum, or just call the other doctor and say, let's look at this. Four, when there's an unreported finding that can com could compromise the patient. And that's how we do it. We believe that this is a good way to do it. We do it routinely, and thus we don't spend so much of our precious time. And the standardization of structuring of reports that uh, Dr. Mo just talked about. I wanted to talk about this. Excellence and excellence in diagnostic imaging and in nuclear cardiology and uh, nuclear medicine. It hasn't gotten to the top yet. We don't look for it. We have to build it every day. We should not afraid of the new technologies. We should keep moving forward and put the clinical results at the availability of everybody because this is the only way that patients will benefit from what we're doing. Thank